Um, so again, and, and I should say that we know Rosemary from the work with clean water, that she's been with us with the National Medical Association. And um, she is, of course, I won't hold this against her since she's a Spelman alum. Uh, <laughs> but it was from an HBCU. Uh, but that's really a, a wonderful thing. She currently serves as the Clean Water for All campaign director. And as I said, she worked in the Obama administration as the deputy associate, associate administrator for public engagement and environmental protection at the EPA. Um, so I won't give a lot of other information. I'll allow her to spend more time in speaking with that. But she has to be a good person because she comes from Mississippi. <laughs> and all of us Mississippians, <laughs> we stick together, we're family. And I see a couple of other Mississippians yeah. there. <laughs> there. <laughs> OK, and Drew Elon, being the National Director for Advocacy and Public Policy with Mocha Moms, Inc. Um, she also served in the uh, Obama administration as an appointee to the EPA, and she was the senior official uh, at EPA, so uh, serving as a principal advisor on strategic stakeholder engagement, working with the administrator, Lisa Jackson, um, who was also a wonderful administrator. And prior to joining the EPA, uh, Drew has worked as a director for development for Pathways, which is a homeless shelter for women and children in Birmingham, Alabama. And so Alabama being close to Mississippi, we are all kindred spirits here. Except <laughs> Roll Tide. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't do Roll Tide. Okay. <laughs> okay. But as I've indicated, we're connected with Mississippi and the Southern Connection, Mocha Moms, Soros. <laughs> uh, so again, welcome both of you to MedKai, which is the local affiliate of the National Medical Association. And we have been really very much engaged in clean water and clean air as part of uh, what we're doing at the National Medical Association, given its impact on the health of our constituents, both children and adults. And so again, we welcome you. Please, we'll turn it over to Rosemary. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and thank you all for participating. I am really excited to be here to have this conversation with you all. Um, this is going to be a really great panel. Um, Dr. Brown has some really awesome questions that she's going to be asking us, and so I'm really excited to start the conversation. Um, again, I am the campaign director from the Clean Water for All campaign, and the Clean Water for All campaign is a, is a coalition of groups from various sectors, from the faith community, the business community, the environmental community, um, you know, hunting, fishing, anglers. Um, everybody coming together as a collective to fight for clean water protections. Um, one of the biggest things that, that is happening right now is that our water is at stake. Um, and we, as um, the African American community, need to make sure that our voices are being heard in the conversation and that we have a seat at the table. Um, because there's no voice more critical than yours. Um, and, you know, I want to make sure as the campaign director for this campaign that the African American voice is, is uplifted and that we don't have other people speaking for us at the table when it's time to talk about environmental justice. Um, but again, as you know, our water is at stake. Um, if you think about places like Flint, Michigan, um, those are not, that's not a, 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 a Thing that's not happening across the country. Um, you think about places like East Indiana, uh, East Chicago, Indiana, um, that they, they had levels higher than Flint um, for lead contamination in their waters. And it's happening across the a country. Um, there are places in Louisiana, there are places in Mississippi, Alabama, so many places across the country who have contaminated water. And the people who are hurt the most are the, are the most vulnerable, um, which are African American communities and low income communities. And so I am here to bring awareness to that, and I am really excited to be working in partnership with the National Medical Association around talking about public health and the environment. And I should say, D.C. has some contaminated yeah, water. DC, and of yeah. course, if we look at Puerto Rico, where they oh, just so had the uh, hurricane, um, and the person was saying, yes, drink this water, contaminated. Yeah. So it, it is really impacting our patients mm -hmm. and our people. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so Drew. Hi. Um, as Dr. Brown said, I am Drew Elons, and I'm representing... Uh, Mocha Moms. And one of the things I think I really wanted to share with you is the importance that um, the doctors have in our lives as a mom, as a wife, um, 
as a woman, how much I depend and rely on what my doctors have to say about myself, about my husband, about my children, about my mom, um, and we really do rely on you. And it was interesting when we first got in here, we were having conversations, and first I want to tell you a little bit about Mocha Moms. And well, we started out um, as an organization for moms of color, specifically moms who stayed at home, um, because there was no support group for us moms who uh, made that choice uh, with our families to, to stay home and to care or make family first. And at the end of the day, though, one of the things we recognized, um, especially after the 2008, um, 2007, 2008 um, economic crash, many of us um, had to go back to work, or many of us were planning to go back anyway at some point, but moms still needed support. Um, and our organization focuses on the mother and our children and our family benefit from our connection. Um, and the key here is we in my Silver Spring chapter specifically, when I first moved here, um, we came with the uh, Obama administration in 2009. My husband worked in the White House and I was still home with our son. And I was away from everyone. And so I relied heavily upon all of my new mocha moms and like I need a doctor <laughs> Spe specifically I want an African-American female guy. like I just like spell stuff out and they were all able to help us um, and once we started doing that and then we started our, our listserv is a way that we actually help one another and anytime something's happening we actually had a few doctors that were a part of mocha moms and they will always give us types of um, advice that would help us as things are going on around us. My time in the EPA is when I actually brought Mocha Moms really into the fold because as Rosemary said, the African American voice is very critical to the discussion. And I know she's working with the uh, um, environmental organization, but many of the landscape of the environmental organization don't look like us. And they're the ones that's at the table and they're trying to advocate for us, but they don't really understand us. So when we think about that and we think about the importance of our medical doctors, you know, there was a time and people ask me all the time, why do you come in and say, I'm looking for a black doctor? I said, because there was a time that that was all we could use. And I still feel like they give us because they understand us. And I remember my first few weeks at EPA and they started, you know, I came as a novice. I was not a, you know, I might recycle. That was probably my goal. I was like, what? I'm going to the EPA? What? Okay. Um, and I remember a conversation that we were having. They were t talking about radon and radon poisoning. And we lived in an old house in Birmingham, so I was like, <coughs> freaking out. Even though we lived in the house, our son, we left Birmingham when he was about two months old. But I was thinking, oh, my, my child might have radon poisoning. And my doctor, his doctor, I called him my doctor, his doctor was like, girl, Two things are going to happen. One of two things need to happen. You're going to have to find you a new doctor, <laughs> or you're going to have to leave the EPA, or the third thing is just let me be the doctor. Uh, because I will freak out. Like, they're saying this is happening, and this water is happening. And even though, think about this, the professionals, the scientists that's at the EPA were telling me, well, really, they were educating me so that I could educate others, but I was internalizing it and running to my doctor. That's how important you are. They told me stuff, they got the science, but I ran to my doctor and say, how does this impact us? Uh, can you test my blood? Can you Calm down. Were you, you know, were you impacted by this? Were you here? Were you there? And I was like, no. And they were like, well, you're fine. Your child does not have radon poisoning. He does not have asthma. He does not have, like, <laughs> I just really, everything I learned, I internalized, but I went to my doctor. So you all are a safe space. You all are the people who we really come to and understand. So I'm honored to be here and have this conversation with you all and talk about the importance of the linkages that you have. And the more information you are armed with, the better you are to be able to help us uh, as mothers and as families um, navigate what's happening in this world. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? Yes, we've had a few other people come in as we've been started, and so we want to welcome the congressman Thank from you. Virginia. Um, but this is really important that you could join us. Um, My honor. 
And I'm sorry that we sort of started, you know. We no, I was running late. We were in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stand about traffic there. We were running on congressional time. So <laughs> yes, yes. Ahead. But there's some really important things going on in Congress, and so uh, we again want to welcome you. I'm Doris Brown. And, Thank you, ma'am. And um, I, I met you a couple of weeks ago at the Congressional Black Caucus Program. You were yes, on the uh, prostate. Uh, program, I believe, yes, in that ma'am. morning, and I followed you. Uh, you followed me, I'm not sure, but on that I was program. following you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So welcome. We thank, thank you, you so much. Um, and I'll just give a brief uh, comment about you and then have you to, um, again, tell us all about things that you're doing in Congress, uh-huh. and then I'll, I'll ask Drew if you have other things that you want to say. We'll come back and <laughs> finish up your stories here. So again, um, this is the MedCai local affiliate of the National Medical Association, and we have all of our members here and guests, and we certainly welcome you. Uh, Congressman uh, Donald McEachin comes from the Congressional District of Virginia, and I think that's the fourth district. That's right. um, he is new. He's the, the freshman congressman. <laughs> this is uh, his, and they're breaking you in well because I see he's very active. He serves as the co-president of the freshman class. He's appointed as the regional whip, and he serves as a member of the leaders environmental messaging team. So he uh, again some very key committees that he's on such as representing the district on the House Armed Services Committee. I'm a retired military person, so I know that's <laughs> keenly important. Thank you for your Keeps service. us to get the money there. Thank you. And you know what today is, or tomorrow, yes, uh, not yet, Saturday. tomorrow and then Saturday, Saturday is that big day that uh, they allow us to have a little time to, to bask in some glory. It's called Veterans Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, in addition to being on the uh, House Committee uh, for Armed Services, he's also on the House Committee of Natural Resources, um, and he serves as the ranking member of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee and sits on the Subcommittee for Federal Lands. He uh, sits both the Readiness and the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee under the House Armed Services Committee. Um, He has been appointed, as I've indicated, as the House leadership to serve on the Franking Commission. Um, Before coming to Congress, he was a legislator in the state of Virginia, uh, particularly in the General Assembly, and served there for 20 years. Almost 20, yeah. I don't know where the time went. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you're so young. (laughs) First, he served in the House of Delegates in Virginia and then in the Virginia State Senate. He serves as the elected, uh, he was elected by the state Democrats to serve on the Senate Democratic Caucus Chair in 2011. Um, He spent a lot of time as a public servant and he's been fighting to protect the vulnerable citizens such as ourselves and the patients that we serve. He is dedicated to defending the rights of all Virginians and improving the lives of others. And I want to say, you've done so well in Virginia and trained them so well. They turned out. They turned out this yes. week, and we are so proud of we're that. We're very proud of them. Yes, yeah. we're very proud of Virginia. So again, welcome, Congressman Donald McKeach. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, and again, I apologize for my tardiness. It is uh, good to be with you all. I have to start off with uh, sharing with you that I have a teeny bit of medicine in my background because my grandfather uh, was a Howard Med graduate. I never knew him, so all I have is the stories. He practiced medicine in Newport News, Virginia. And uh, I always remember my daddy telling me that he was one of the top physicians. Of course, my daddy was biased, right? Um, (laughs) But you know, the African-American physician has always been sort of the the glue that helped hold mm-hmm. the community together. Because he, he would talk about the times when, you know, folks didn't have any money, so they'd bring him a couple of chickens, mm-hmm. a dozen eggs, and, mm-hmm. and, and barter with mm-hmm. them. But the stories I enjoyed the most were the fact that uh, when the white folks got sick, they'd sneak over to his office, right? Yep. And, and, and he, would, he would treat them as well. And so I just salute you all as African-American physicians, because you all have been heading your shoulder at the wheel for so long. You, you know, you uh, keep us healthy. You make up our essentially our middle class for all politics and purposes, and so you all have been a driving force in our community for oh so many years. And I am just pleased to be with you today because I think it's you're absolutely the right group to talk to uh, about the environment because 
the health conditions that you see every day, whether it's mm -hmm. exposure to lead, whether it's asthma rates, all these things can be traced back to really environmental injustice um, between the, the redlining of our of our communities and, and the uh, sometimes the inaction of our communities. And that inaction oftentimes comes from not knowing uh, we end up somehow close to nuclear plants, so somehow we end up close to uh, landfills and, and the poison that emanates from them. And so you all are the, on the front lines of, of fighting those fights, and you all know the statistics as well as I do in terms of our asthma rates, not only for us, but also other children of color, our Latino brothers and sisters as well. Um, that's one of the reasons that when I got here, we decided to form the Environmental Justice Coalition. We have a fancy name for it, I always screw it up, but it's an Environmental Justice Coalition with myself, Nanette Barragon from California, and uh, uh, Palmyra Jayapal from Washington State. We have formed a coalition to talk about these issues. Um, you know, a lot of us as environmentalists like to talk about the bright, shiny objects, and I don't mean to diminish their importance. I mean, renewable energy is awfully important. Having uh, solar panels and having wind turbines, those are things that are awfully important. But while we're having that discussion, let us not forget environmental justice issues, and, and that's what the three of us are about. And we've had a modicum of success so far making sure that those voices are heard. And uh, to the extent that you can add to our, our voices, we, we, we certainly welcome you. Um, one of the challenges, I never like to go to a place and, and not give them a challenge, and so I want to issue a challenge to you. One of the problems with the environmental movement, as I see it, is, is that we all come to it from our particular silos, right? For me, um, I had an epiphany. I, probably in the 90s when I was first elected to the House of Delegates, I was agnostic to the environment. Uh, but then a couple of things happened along the way. I, w I lost an election or two, and, um, and uh, as I was preparing to come back, I decided I would go to seminary. And so I went to the Sam Woodward Proctor School of Theology down at Virginia Union University and became exposed to the notion of, of uh, creation care. At the same time, so that's sort of what's going on in the spiritual, at the same time what's going on in the natural is, is that a particular person who really wanted to help me get elected because she just had it with her elected representative was just all up in my ear talking about the environment. And so, you know, sometimes, I'm a Mac each, and so sometimes a little slow, but when you have it happening in the natural, you have it happening in the spiritual, I got the clue that I need to be concerned about the environment, and that's really where, where my passion came from. But see, I approach it from a, a place of, of, of moral value, a place of, 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 of spirit, if you, if you will. Uh, I'm not going to presume to say how you all approach it, but clearly you have to approach it from a public health perspective. Um, I can tell you that between the two of us, we're not going to be able to gen up the environmental movement the way we really need to, especially among our people. You know, one of the things that I'm trying to get the seminaries to do is to start teaching preachers how to preach the environment, because I think if we can raise that consciousness within the church, we'll, we'll go a long way in terms of talking about, uh, in, in terms of making sure that our people understand how important the environment is. But that is not enough, and I would submit to you that you all approaching it from a public health perspective is not enough, because some people just don't care about their health, right? I mean, you see them every day. You know, no matter how much you tell them to get off that sweet tea, they're not going to leave that sweet tea alone. No matter how much you tell them to leave that, and I'm coming over there for it. <laughs> no matter how much you tell them to leave that red meat, they're not going to leave that red meat alone, right? So, and, and so too it is with the environment. So we have to step out of our comfort zones. Um, we have to start joining organizations. Uh, there, there are Sierra Club chapters in your locality. There are legal conservation chapters in your locality. There are moms in your locality. Did I hear you talking about moms? Local moms. Mm -hmm. Local moms. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and being able to integrate yourself with those organizations so that you're bringing the public health perspective, you're understanding their perspective. And I think as we start to build those synergies, we will do, go a long way in our community to uh, fighting this issue because I am absolutely convinced that the most important issue of the 21st century is the environment. From a health perspective, from a jobs perspective, from a moral perspective, I think that we absolutely have to get it right. And so, again, I am just thrilled to be here with you. I'm thrilled to know that you all have assembled here and, um, and, and are uh, trying to take the bull by the horns. 
let me suggest to you that to the extent that you all are in fraternities and sororities, let me ask, does your fraternity and sorority have an environmental group mm -hmm. committee within it? All these things, you, you have the ability to bring all your knowledge and, and integrate it in so many different areas of our society that, um, uh, that I just implore you to do it because, again, it's sort of like when we're in church, right? We always say we have to take the message beyond the four, church, the, the four walls of the church. You all need to take the message beyond your, your medical practices, beyond your hospitals and your clinics, and help take it into the community. And, and the charge is the same for me because I need to expand my, my vision as well. But I am convinced that together we can get this done. And so, again, I applaud you all for being here. I'm not going to trespass on your time. Uh, I'm eyeballing that sweet tea. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm going to have some, even though my doctor doesn't want me to have it either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all. So any questions I can answer? Uh, I don't want to interrupt much longer, but I, I'm happy to field any questions if y'all have any. Yes, well, you have questions? What is your, your take, your position on what uh, Secretary Pruitt is doing well, he has decided that he's going to favor business over science, and um, and uh, the the whole of the administration's take. In addition, the administration has two goals, and they're not they they sort of uh, jive with one another. They're trying to uh, eliminate uh, the legacy of President Obama, mm -hmm. and you see them whether they're doing it through Obamacare, whether they're doing it through the Clean Power Act, and the other things that he was able to accomplish during his presidency, and they're sort of turning everything over to big business. And uh, especially when it gets down to the EPA, and I serve on the Natural Resources Committee, so we have jurisdiction over the EPA and over the Department of the Interior. We see a lot of that, uh, the rolling back of regulations, Obama era regulations, and that sort of thing. So, you know, he's a, he's a climate science denier, um, and it's a shame that we have gotten to this point where we have to have a conversation about whether we're going to believe in science or not. But that's where we find ourselves. And, you know, I think the results yesterday hearken to uh, the fact that Americans aren't going to stand for that. Because I think Virginia is a microcosm of America. And I think as you see the elections roll out this year, I mean, when I say this year, I'm talking about 18 and then again in 2020, I think you're going to see the, the backlash continue. But, you know, we have to make that happen, right? We can't just wish it into being. It has to actually happen. So that's, that's my take on, set, on uh, Mr. Pruitt. Well, along those same lines, um, I wanted to ask again, what is it that we can do as um, health care providers when we continue to see this regulatory rollback and also the nomination of three additional people that was undergoing Senate hearing earlier this week that are disastrous um, if they get um, uh, selected to take the positions in EPA. So uh, as providers, is it that we start to make more calls and more letters? What What is it you, that we you do? You do that, and I understand that you were a rock star yesterday <laughs> in terms of your, your advocacy, so thank you, thank you for that. But also remember that, um, and, and this is where we as African Americans uh, slip up sometimes and we forget that we live in a federal system, right? And we're so used to turning to the federal government for our relief because historically that has been the place for our relief. But we all live in states. And we all have states that have Department of Environmental Quality or, or, a, 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 or essentially a Department of Environmental Quality. That's what we call it in Virginia. And so you should be petitioning your governor. You should be petitioning your state reps. You know, especially your African-American state reps, because let's, let's just talk facts for a second, right? There are not that many places that African-American legislators can go to get donations. That's why we're always calling you all, right? Trying to drag you out your practice. Can you send me $250? Well, leverage that, right? Leverage that. Make, make sure that they are talking about the environment. Make sure that they understand the environmental impact that it's having on, on our communities. And other people are going to call you for money. Use, that, use the fact that people call you for help to ask them to help you. Um, because there is, there is no, especially in the Democratic Party, there is no way to really get elected in any urban area or any really any place on the eastern seaboard I would suggest to you without having to uh, having to come through the African American community for something and that coming through the African American community let's face it is going to be preachers lawyers and doctors and you're one third of those right you're the doctors so um, 
we just ask you to be politically savvy as, as folks call on you. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was somewhat dismayed yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, when I saw excerpts of, uh, I think her name was Kathleen Hartnett White. Yes. Who is nominated to be the Council of Environmental uh, just Quality. quality. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, I was aghast <laughs> at some of the responses that this lady had. I mean, one question was about boiling water. Does water expand when it's heated? She couldn't do that. And she, I mean, I, I just said, And oh, she said, you know, uh, the ozone particulates are not a problem unless you're going to put your face down and uh, get the fumes out of the exhaust from a car. <laughs> right, and no particulates from coal. Yes. So I'm saying, how, how does the other party, whoever's her advocate, how, how do they get away with this? The pushback, what happens? Part of it is because their districts are so gerrymandered, okay. right? Don't forget, I mean, the, you know, in, in uh, a lot of these Republican districts, the only people they have to listen to are the far right. And the far right is really dominated, whether they know it or not, by the Koch brothers. Right. You know, and these are not folks who care about the environment. They care about making money. Uh, and they can only see one way to make money because there's plenty of ways to make money by cleaning up the environment. And, you know, and they're fixing to leave us a legacy where we're going to have to clean up a lot of stuff. So there's going to be money in restoring the environment. But that's beside the point. Um, and so when you have districts like that, which is another thing that you can get yourselves involved in, I don't want to get you too spread out there, but there will be a conversation coming up about how these districts are going to be drawn in the next census, right? The next census is just a few years away in 2020. Um, you need to be part of that conversation if you can be, uh, because that's how we get to the place where we are now, where districts are so uh, divergent. And so you've got folks in ruby red districts, Republicans in ruby red districts, that don't need to listen to moderates, that don't need to listen to people who believe in science, they just need to listen to the far right, and that's how we get there. That's how they can get away with this. Well, yes, sir. How do the scientists at EPA who are getting frustrated and beating their heads against the wall and some of them are bailing out, how, how can they maintain a position in the EPA and be empowered? Well, some of them are civil servants, so they're protected from political uh, pressures. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to necessarily get their point of view acro across, but, uh, you know, they'll be able to hold on to their jobs. Some are just leaving, right? Some of them are so frustrated they're just packing their bags and leaving. And, and that's part of the problem with this administration. And I'm, I don't mean to digress, but we see it across a lot of different platforms. We see it in the environmental area. We see it with our diplomats, right? Our diplomatic corps is so frustrated that good diplomats are leaving the State Department. And beyond that, the, the <coughs> pipeline, and this goes for the next generation of scientists, too, who are in college right now and they're looking at what's happening in Washington, whether they're scientists or, or want to be diplomats, they're like, I'm not going into that. Why do I want to go into, into that when I see what's happening in Washington? So we've got a problem, folks, but you know, we just have, the only way we can address it is step by step. The longest journey starts with a single step. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, I just <coughs> ask you to do the basics, the blocking and tackling. You're going to be called on for money. You need to take those opportunities to talk about the environment. Um, you're going to be called on to, you know, sign petitions and knock on doors. That's how I got into it, right? Remember I told you about the lady all up in my ear? Well, she's all up in my ear while we're going and getting petitions signed and all that stuff, that, all the ingredients of a campaign. You know, it, it is politics is a contact sport, and sadly, all of us, including me, want to live in our little silos, right? When I was a lawyer, I just wanted to practice law. I didn't want to do anything else. Your doctors, I dare say, you would just assume be clinicians and just leave everything else alone. But especially in this age of Trump, we are called upon to do more. You know, you all are the intellectual powerhouse of the African-American community. You all are called upon to do more than, uh, than, your, than your calling of being healers. And so um, I just ask you to accept that charge. Well, I have one final okay. question. Yes, ma'am. Um, and it's about funding for the agency, Action Climate Change and Protecting Clean Water. What's happening with that in EPA? You know, I am sure that it's been cut. I'm sure that it's been cut drastically. <laughs> to give you a more precise answer, we'll have to get back to you. And I'm happy to, you know, drop you a line or send you an email to give you precise answers about that. Okay. Good. Hey, right. Thank you. And I was going to ask you a budgetary question. You know, he wants to cut President 18... HHS by 18% slash the EPA. What kind of pushback 
will he get in the House? I mean, is there a, a groundswell? Uh, he's going to he's gonna get a lot of Democratic pushback. He's not going to get a lot of Republican pushback. Of course, they, they run now. the House. <laughs> the yes, well, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if they've learned their lesson. We'll find out. But, but I do think that uh, right now, still, the Senate is where all the adults are. And so we're going to have to put our hopes that the Senate will be able to s slow this down. <coughs> Okay, well, are there other questions? I'll just make a, a comment in okay. response to the question here. So some of the folks that I know who are hunkered down in, in government, they call themselves the B team. We be here when you get here, and yeah. we be here when you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. B for bureaucrat, right? God bless you. Run out of country. And they just try to hunker down and not only keep their jobs as they maintain, but do, do what they can do. Uh, you know, from the inside, because um, there will be change. Will happen. There will be change. Yes. Yeah. And so, I'd like to ask the other panelists any comments, any final words that you'd like to give us. I would just, you know, say that thank you to the congressman, yes. and I would definitely agree with him. You know, when it comes to clean water, we are seeing attacks. Um, on every side and so we need your voices to be a part of that conversation um, you know we have some budget fights for the EPA EPA is losing funding or they're you know trying to pull funding from EPA which means they can't put, do their jobs of ma making sure that you guys are protected um, and enforcing these regulations and so you know your voices are, are extremely credible and we need you guys to be a part of this fight um, you know and for the folks who are at, at EPA Drew and I were at EPA together um, oh, and yeah. we know um, you know, a, a lot of the staff who are at EPA and who yes. are, are trying to um, stay in the fight. Um, mm -hmm. But these people have been working on, on this stuff from climate to water for years. Yes. And they're having to pull back the things that they have done over the last mm -hmm. 30, 40 years around water and climate. Um, we were both there under President Obama um, doing work around the Clean Power Plan and mm -hmm. the Clean Water Rule. Two things that this this administration has repealed um, mm -hmm. and they're trying to replace. Um, and those two things have broad support from the public. And right. so, you know, there is no rationale behind it. Um, we know that he is doing this because of the industry industry folks and putting industry over, over our protections, public mm -hmm. health protections. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I know nobody in this room can raise their hand and say they don't know anybody who doesn't have asthma, a child. Um, and that's alarming. Um, and so we need to make sure as physicians that you guys are a part of the conversation and advocating on behalf mm -hmm. um, of the folks that you represent in your in your uh, in the in the communities communities that you come from and so I just want to thank you guys for having this and, yeah and I was just gonna here. just add two things one as far as the B team um, one of the things I've learned I, I remember during our introduction to um, being a part as an appointee and we had our training and in our training we had someone who was you know from being a former political appointee and you had uh, people who were political appointee who then became career and they said the same thing that we you know you have to remind yourself in working with your civil service your career employees is that they are on a marathon mm -hmm. and you are on a sprint and so if we keep that in mind number 45 is on a sprint and those folks who are there the B team are on a marathon and the truth of the matter is no matter what agency they're in they know where <coughs> excuse me everything is and they know how to guide a whole lot of stuff and so I learned how to make good friends real quick to get to yes anything that we wanted to do I got to yes with the general counsel with everybody um, but know that they know how to kibosh some stuff that might not be the biggest things right if they're not getting funding they can't control that if um, there are certain things that can't go through they can't control that but there are certain things that they uh, understand how to work out so I find that um, very important I think the other thing that I would ask of um, your membership from um, National Medical Association locally and abroad is whenever there is something that is being uh, held accountable or being before Congress um, if there's ever a way that you can have some sort of um, fact sheet um, in your offices to really talk about if this is not happening this is what it means to your health the health of your children the health of your family those type of things because if it is made clear because you have credibility I said at the top when I first got to EPA I was kind of like you I, I might recycle I knew that much <laughs> um, but when I learned stuff 
I still went back to my doctor, even though I'm in these briefings and they're telling me all these horrible things. I go back to my doctor and say, they said this, this, and this, and this. And she would give me comfort and tell me how to deal with that. So you all have credibility. And so whatever extent you can is to have that type of information to talk about. Even if it's as simple as when the air is bad, this is what it means. And if you live near those power things, this is what it means to your community. And if you can, call, text, email um, our members, our Congress, to make sure that they understand we need to keep those regulations in place to keep our family and our communities healthy. Um, anytime that you can do that, we ask that. Anytime you can partner with a, 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 a house of worship and give that message, um, connecting it back to health and make it plain. I think that is where um, your significance will be there uh, and will be very, very helpful because you have the credibility in our community. Any last words? No, the only last thing I'll say is this, and I know I'm repeating myself, is just don't forget, everybody looks to Washington, but don't forget to look at your local capitals too, right? Yes. Because a lot of these, a lot of these decisions, especially siting decisions, while they might get permission from uh, the federal government, the actual location of the site is determined locally. And so making sure that you're dealing with all the way up and down, right? Not only your state legislators, but your city council people, uh, those all those folks matter in, in all of this. So it's uh, it, the system is built to preserve the status quo, and it does a pretty good job of that, right? Because it's hard to make things happen. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but just understand if you want to make things happen, you got to be mobile. You got to be able to talk to all different levels. So Congress is here to help you. The Congressional Black Caucus adores you and is more than happy to help. Um, but there are other units of government too that that you can affect as well. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming, uh, and I want to say to the congressman, in March we're going to have our health legislative <coughs> here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we will cover a number of issues, and I do hope that you're going to be engaged because we have a policy side and an advocacy side, and the policy we will have national, state, and local legislators to come to speak with us about policies that are going to impact our patient population. And then we will have the advocacy groups, our social organizations such as the Greeks and others, <coughs> as well as our faith-based organizations to get the word out to the community. Well, we're a phone call so away. Just absolutely. <laughs> you'll, you'll get some information on that. Thank you all for coming, and please go get some sweet tea. I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs>